Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're gonna to be talking about whether or not Hashimoto's thyroiditis is genetic. Now, spoiler alert, the answer is yes, there's a strong genetic component. So if you have been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, yin, yin, yes, there is a, a good chance that you have these underlying genes. Now, what's important is not that this is a genetic condition. What's important is that unlike some of the other conditions that exist out there, medical diseases and consequences um, of your genetics, this is not something that has to occur. So in other words, you need a combination of genetics plus something else, which I'll be talking about in just a minute, in order to manifest the disease. And this is so, so, so important for you listening to this because you don't have control over your genetics, but you do have control over the things that your body is coming into contact with to some degree, to, to a large degree. And if you can identify these things, if you know about them, then number one, you can try to avoid them, right? To prevent your disease from manifesting itself. Or number two, you can use this information to try and treat your condition if you already have been diagnosed with the disease to begin with. So let's talk about these. And to do that, I'm gonna be using this diagram right here. So at the top it says, promoting factors for AITD, and AITD just stands for autoimmune thyroid disease. So what I wanna point out, I'm talking about Hashimoto's today, um, I'm gonna be focusing on Hashimoto's, but this information also applies to Graves' disease because they're both autoimmune thyroid diseases, right? And this will be made a little more clear as we continue to go on. So let's talk first about the endogenous factors, which are the things inside of you. This just refers to your genetics. Um, and that's just a fancy way of calling these your genes. Now, if you are um, going to develop Hashimoto's, then a couple of these things most likely are going to be present in your body. You're gonna have one or more of these genetic defects. The first one is the HLA class DR3 or DR5 genetic um, condition. So if you have that underlying gene, you're just more likely to develop Hashimoto's if you also come into contact um, with the factors we're gonna be talking about in just a minute here. Then we have the CTLA-4 receptor uh, and then PTN22. So these are all genes associated with Hashimoto's. Now, I don't wanna to focus too much on those because if you have them, you have them. There's not much you can do, you're just born with it. And this is why patients, or this is why um, family members, if they have a mother or father who has Hashimoto's, they're much more likely to develop Hashimoto's because these are probably the genes that are being passed down um, from family member to family member and so on. Now, some of these are also a little bit unique. So for instance, female sex. We know that just being female is enough to increase your risk of developing Hashimoto's regardless of these genes, right? Whether or not you have these genes. And that that's a, this is a complex topic, but probably one of the main reasons for that is the decrease in natural level or just the lower level of testosterone found in, in women compared to men, just a baseline. Then we also have pregnancy. So pregnancy all by itself, regardless of your genes, is enough to increase your risk. And that's because pregnancy, in the pregnant state, your body has, your body suppresses its immune function so that it doesn't destroy or identify or kill the developing child. Then we have skewed X chromosome inactivation. And what this refers to is that women have uh, two X chromosomes, right? They have, and they only need one. So early on in development, the body will inactivate one of those. And if you can think about it like this, one of those X chromosomes might have these genetic mutations up here that we mentioned previously, and one might not. And so if your body just randomly gets rid of one, it might you might get lucky and get rid of the one that has the bad genes, or you might get unlucky and leave more of the, more of the X chromosomes that have the bad genes. And so generally this occurs at about a 50-50 split, but it's possible that you might have a a representation of 70% of the bad X chromosome, therefore you'll have a higher amount of these genes floating around in your body because they're in various cells and then therefore you're more likely to develop the condition. And so that's just, that's just sort of bad luck. Um, there might be more to it, but we don't completely understand uh, the factors involved there. So these are the genetic underlying pre uh, factors that increase your risk for developing it, but by themselves, they're not enough. So in other words, you need to have this plus something else and the other something else that we're gonna be talking about, these are the exogenous factors. These are environmental things, things that your body comes into contact with. And this is important because you have control over many of these things. Well, partly, and we'll talk about that. So in the setting of these factors over here, the HLA class DR3, female sex, pregnancy, et cetera, if you have these and you come into contact with something like high doses of iodine, now you're creating the powder keg for developing Hashimoto's. And this, by the way, 
is something you absolutely have control over. You can control how much iodine you consume, and you can also avoid um, consuming high doses of iodine, which is what I recommend, because I just don't think the risks are worth the reward. There is a high risk, if you have these underlying factors, that you'll develop the autoimmune thyroid disease, and and it's just not worth it. Why would you take high dose iodine when there are other other therapies that you can use which are just as effective, if not more effective, without the risk. Now, if you don't have these underlying factors, like these genetics over here, you're not a, you're not a female, you're not pregnant, you don't have the issue with skewed X chromosome inactivation, you don't have the HLA DR3 uh, or 5 um, uh, genetics, then yeah, you can probably get by taking high dose iodine. And that's why you see a lot of people who take high dose iodine and they, and they feel better. And then people like you, perhaps listening to this, will use it and then you'll develop Hashimoto's and you'll be like, what happened here? Well, what happened here are all of these factors over here. So we have high iodine exposure as an exogenous factor. We have infections. So lots of different infections, if you have the underlying genetics, can trigger them. And one of the most popular that, that a lot of people talk about is Epstein-Barr viral infection. So that's EBV. But there are plenty of others. I'm just going to name that one here. Number three, we have cytokines. So cytokines is sort of an inflammatory response that occurs, can occur due to a lot of different things, including the response of, a, of an infection. So if you have a robust inflammatory response due to any sort of infection or inflammatory response in the side of the body, that is enough all by itself to trigger the uh, autoimmune thyroid disease. And then lastly, we have environmental toxicants. So these, again, are something that you have control over for the most part. So with the exception of something like radiation, um, you know, just if you're going to go get an x-ray or a CT scan or something like that, if you can protect your thyroid or at least only do the CT, CT scan or the x-ray in an area that you have to. Don't do, you know, an excessive amount of, of your body. But we also have things like prescription medications. Again, something you have control over. That would be like lithium or amiodarone. We also have um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I did a video talking about why you shouldn't, if you're a thyroid patient, why you shouldn't avoid, or why you should avoid touching receipts because it has uh, BPA or bisphenol A in it. And a lot of people were like, are you serious? Should you do that? And my response is yes, absolutely. Why would you do something if you don't have to? Now don't go crazy and change your life and live in a bubble. But if it's something as easy as just saying, hey, toss that receipt in the bag so I don't have to touch it, why on earth would you touch it? You're just increasing your risk if you have this genetic underlying predisposition. Um, and then also heavy metals. So uh, environmental toxicants like heavy metals, um, lead, mercury, arsenic, etc. Those can also trigger Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So let's, let's go down here and I want to explain this a little bit further. So we have the exogenous factors, which those are the things that you're coming into contact with. We have the endogenous factors that's inside of you. Those are the genetics. And then what happens? How do we go from there to developing Hashimoto's thyroid, or thyroid disease or Graves' disease, which is what this diagram is really highlighting here. So if you have those two things that are true, the endogenous plus the exogenous, then you get the release of antigens from the thyroid gland because the body and the immune system needs to see that there's something inside of the thyroid gland that it has to attack. And in order for that to happen, usually what occurs is you have damage or death of the thyroid, some cells inside of the thyroid gland. Then you have the contents of those cells. You can imagine them splitting open and then spewing out inside of your, your bloodstream. And then your immune system identifies them and says, hey, what is this? Well, if it's Hashimoto's, it's either thyroid peroxidase, which is a protein, or thyroglobulin, which is another protein. So there's two proteins inside of the thyroid gland. And if your immune system identifies those things with the exogenous and the endogenous factors, being present above that, then it starts creating um, uh, immunoglobulins to identify those things and to kill them. And so that's where you get the B cell involvement, the CD4 cell involvement, and the CD8 cell involvement. On the flip side, if you have Graves' disease, instead of having uh, the antibodies produced to thyroglobulin and thyroid peroxidase, you get the antibodies produced to the thyroid simulating hormone receptor. But if you notice up here, it's all the same. It's all the same, the same factors, um, the same underlying genetics, it's just a difference in terms of how it is manifested inside of the body. And this is important because the treatment is almost always the same for Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, outside of the thyroid medication and reducing thyroid function. But the underlying cause, the root causes are almost, they're very similar, they're very similar. So whenever I talk about treatments for Hashimoto's, there's a ton of crossover between those treatments for Hashimoto's and those treatments for Graves'.
So then at the end of this, kind of if you continue to follow down this pattern, you'll see that Hashimoto's thyroiditis results in necrosis, cell death, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and then more apoptosis, right? That's what's happening to your thyroid gland. If you let this, this, uh, uh, this flow diagram run, what you're gonna end up with is thyroid gland damage. On the flip side on Graves' disease, you end up with iodide metabolism, which is pr the production of thyroid hormone, right? That's why Graves' disease ends up patients end up hyperthyroid, but then you also get some apoptosis, which is cell death as well. And this is really what you want to prevent. You do not want your disease to get so, you don't want your Hashimoto's or Graves' disease to result in thyroid gland destruction. That's, that's the main thing. So we can use this information, if we go back up here, to help you as the thyroid patient, right? So what does this mean? What is the bottom line here? The bottom line is you can't control your genetics. You're born that way, okay, right? I think we can all agree that whatever your genetics are, that's just what they are. But you can control these exogenous factors. You can control how much iodine is inside of your body. So if, if, if iodine was a thing that triggered your autoimmune thyroid disease, you can control that. You can reduce that iodine intake. If it was an infection, sometimes you can treat that infection. There are treatments for EBV, even if you have the chronic type. The acute type you can treat as well, but sometimes you need to cre treat the chronic type. You can detox out these chemicals inside of your body, and that gives you an opportunity to treat upstream, right? To treat at the very base of what triggered your disease to begin with. That's why you must know this if you have any sort of autoimmune thyroid disease, whether it's Graves or Hashimoto's. Now, my recommendation to you is I have a lot of videos which discuss how to reduce these antibodies because if you can reduce the antibodies, then you're treating upstream, you're treating the root cause. So I'd recommend if you have autoimmune thyroid disease that you check out this video, which goes over how to reduce those antibodies by treating these exogenous factors, by treating these root causes. And I recommend that you check out that video next.